Na pre. Sa! É isso, Azaka. A gente tá em Los Angeles. Nós fomos convidados pela Sony Pictures. Pra, Animation. Pra gente visitar a Sony Pictures Animation. Animation. <risos> Exatamente. Pra gente conhecer mais sobre o universo. Pagar nossa dívida com a Aranha. <risos> Exato. Essa é a parada. A gente ficou Pagar devendo nossa dívida o primeiro... com o Aranha Verso. A gente meio que ignorou o primeiro Aranha Verso, não é verdade? That's true. A gente é. não viu, viu depois. E aí, caraca, que filme não, foda. Esse... Aranha Verso a gente não fez Nerdcast, a gente não falou nada e aí... Gente, um fenômeno, um ganhador de Oscar revolucionário. <risos> então agora o filme está continuando a primeira parte de uma segunda parte, que na verdade é um 2 e 3, que mudou o nome, não é mais parte 1. Um. É pra sempre. Não importa. É pra sempre. Aranha Verso, Aranha é pra sempre. Verso Forever. <risos> Que a gente tá nos estúdios de animação da Sony, em Culver City, eles vão fazer um tour. A gente vai em vários lugares diferentes, onde tem um monte de profissionais que trabalham justamente para fazer esse filme incrível, né? Se juntar em tantas artes, tantas áreas diferentes se juntam, né? Para formar né? o conjunto que é o filme. Então é muito maneira a gente conhecer aqui nos estúdios da Sony Animation como que os caras fazem esses processos, desde storyboard, desde visual effects, Concepto. Cons... exatamente, dublagem, cara, né? muito legal, vamos ver. Caraca, é café do mundo, não é da manhã, mano, você tá louco. Em algum lugar do mundo não é. <risos> o multiverso, né? <risos> A gente foi recebido aqui com café da manhã no pátio do estúdio de animação da Sony. Tá todo caracterizado. A Zagal já tá nove e meia da manhã. Ah, em Orlando não é nove e meia da manhã. <risos> olha só, eles botaram posts do filme aqui e olha o que a gente viu aqui. Isso aqui é o coração bate forte, a Zagal. Nossa, olha só. É a, é a, é a primeira, é a capa da revista número 1 um do Homem-Aranha 2099. Tinha a versão metalizada. Tinha a versão metalizada, tinha. Caralho. Tem, eu tenho. Você ainda tem? Olha, oh, Zagal. Das poucas coisas que sobraram nos quadrinhos. É isso aí, Miguelito. Ai, ah, não me vão junto. fazer esse cara ser vilão. Não, calma, calma, calma. Não me inventa essa parada. <risos> aí, a gente tá up to date. Tá rolando a greve dos roteiristas aqui. Caraca, olha, olha aí, Nossa, é verdade. Ali, ó. É isso aí, galera. Vai ter Guild of America. Lutem pelos seus direitos. É isso aí. Será que deveria ter uma greve dos creators? <risos> Melhor não, né? Se a gente fizer a greve dos creators, vão sacar que não faz diferença nenhuma. Não faz falta nenhuma, pode ficar <risos> sem. É, a greve de, de creators e influencers, vão ficar melhor, é verdade. <risos> recentemente visitando um estúdio, um set de filmagem, não posso falar qual é, hein? mas isso é uma parada que a gente acaba perdendo de contexto. Ou tiver uma obra entregue, um filme, uma série, uhum. a gente esquece a quantidade de gente envolvida para aquilo que acontecer. Entendeu? Pois é, exato. Muitas vezes, dependente do resultado final do filme ou da série, as pessoas que trabalham são fenomenais. Sim, às vezes pode ser um filme ruimzão e... Exato, mas com um monte de profissionais incríveis. <risos> exato. Sabe? E que deram o máximo deles e que não é culpa deles. Uhum. ter sido ruim, ou foi o resultado final, a forma como a história foi contada e tal. É uma coisa que a gente tem que trazer pra perspectiva um pouco também, né? É muito maneiro, aí yeah. é. é o que a gente vai ver aqui, os profissionais que estão por trás. Exatamente. Porque a gente só vê o filme, a gente não vê a cara da... E é pessoa. muita gente, muita <risos> gente. Assim, cara, vocês não fazem ideia. Tem desde pessoas que cuidam de plantas, sabe? Uhum, até uhum. pessoal de limpeza, até pessoal que mexe em guindaste e faz maquiagem. É um ambiente muito diverso. Muito fazer maneiro. Para pensar, porque tem, tem de tudo. Vamos entrar. My name's Will. Uh, I'm a visual development artist and I've been on the film for the last two and a half years. Um, and it's the idea of visual development is something we're just going to talk about. It's kind of an insider term, but it's essentially designing the entire film into the um, we design the film twice. So we go through the whole film and we make it everything in drawings and paintings and then it, it gets into 
turn into graphics and what you see is the final film. So we basically like we have several places uh, for design. We have character design, prop design, environment design, color, and light. So with character design, it's we start with uh, you know Miles. He's the main character. So obviously in the first film we knew what he'd look like. He was 13 years old in the first film. He's 15 in this one, right? So he's aged a couple years. We already have a sense of his des his design and his suit, but he's aged a bit. And also just from the previous you know comics that he's been, he's he's got canon. Um, we typically would start with you know for starting from scratch is like is he 10 feet tall two feet tall does he have pink hair bald head whatever but we already knew his ethnicity we knew he came from brooklyn we knew he's a teenager and so we have a lot to start with visually there what we do here is we do something like expression sheets we hire character designers and this was done by uh, jesus iglesias he's one of the premier character designers in the industry and we're super grateful to have him on the project he comes in does what he calls or what we call expression sheets where we figure out the attitude of the character how does he carry himself like what how does he act you know, it's a lot of um, getting the attitude. How do you find attitude in, in somebody who's like in a spider? Spider-Verse costume. Then we, once we figure out all the design, we do drawings and paintings just to figure out logo, proportion, you know, everything. And then we go into 2D paint, which we call uh, character paint or texture paint. In this case, we go in and like zoom in and paint every single detail. It's all about details, really. So we paint every detail of the character. The painting itself will actually get put onto the final model that will then get put into the film. So the idea is, so the idea of graphic edges, nothing's airbrushed, you know, dots. That's why you see the dots and the hatches that are so key to the film. You know, those are, those are all things that you would see in comics printed, you know, forever. So it's a way to like pay homage to that. And it's also a way to establish like our graphic style. So we do 2D character paint to really like zoom in and figure out, you know, how does light react to the skin? Paint textures, like brush textures. We see the hand of the artist, right? Like nothing's, there's no airbrush, no soft edges. Everything's graphic. But, you know, what's the color of the iris? We do that for the face, we do it for portrait, and we do it, obviously, for the heroes of the film. We do them generally for most characters. Ideally, we do it for all characters, but given time, it's like we have to, you know, Miles, Gwen, 2099, etc. we prioritize those guys. But we do it for the suits, too. So this is my character paint for the suit, and this encompasses everything. It's like the texture of the suit, which, fortunately, we had, you know, carried over some textures from the first film, so we had an idea of that. But he's had, at this point, two years to be Spider-Man. So in the first film, his suit was like, I uh, made it through him a suit, he put it on, he spray painted something, and he went out and did it, and, and had, now he's had two years, so he's like engineered his suit a bit, so it's got a few more facets to it, he's had time to think, you know, think through it, he's grown a bit, so he has to make a new one, and so he's got a different logo, he took more time to make his logo, that was one of the fun things I got to do on the film, was actually spray paint the logo in my garage, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's pretty sick, uh, multiple iterations. Does a photo exist of the spray painted garage? I, ha I have all of the stencils in my garage, and I have a photo of my projected self, and I'm going to post that when time is right and all that stuff, too. But yes, I've definitely documented that. Fantastic. They're going to get into fights. How do they look? We need to design how they look when they get damaged, right? So it's not just some random chunk of you know, fabric missing. It's like, he, you know, we want it to look good, too. We consider everything. We even consider his street clothes. So we go into, like, he's from Brooklyn, so it's like, what are the basketball players, you know, who is he into? What kind of jacket does he wear? So these, the jacket's on the left. But we go through, like, probably 50 different color variations of this jacket. You know, little bits and odds and ends movie is so graphic nothing is like a soft focus or soft pull or anything like that it does two things it allows us to create a blur effect right so the more offsets you have uh the the, the more blurred things are the farther away it's set off they seem right so you can control the focus of a painting you control the focus of a shot it also to like paying homage to comics right because a lot of those old comics you know they would misprint them you know misregister the colors and things like that and it just looks cool so it's a small but significant note that you'll see like throughout the film, throughout the art. In some cases, we will specifically bias the color in the character paint because that is like a, they're, they're always going to be lit a certain way. You know, we might do that, but in general, we keep them just like studio lit. Probably, this was the last sheet that we did, but there were months, months of paintings on this guy. Uh, zoomed in focus, there's a glitch. You can see it like a subtle glitch on his like chest in his logo. There's a subtle glow and, and like Mayan texture in his reds. You know, it's very subtle, but it's there. It's like, we did tons of iteration on that. What does that design look like? And fortunately, because this is a film, because it's a Sony, because it's big, it's Spider-Man, we have the time and sort of the breadth to, to take that kind of time to develop it, right? It's like, whereas like sometimes in video games or smaller films or smaller projects, it's like, you gotta get
get stuff done quickly. And then we also, because it is a big thing and because it's a comic book movie, we actually get to find the people who made these comics and get them to help out. So in this case, 2099 was created by Rick Leonardi back in the early 90s as a comic book character. The, he was That was his Spider-Man. And so we had him on come onto the film for probably a few months here and there. Come on, come off, whatever, help out. But he gave us a guide. Because 2099 is so kind of, there's a specific style, right? Like we I want to pay homage to the comics. So we don't just want to make him look like anybody. We want to make him look like the 2099. So we've got the guy who made him giving us a breakdown of actually how he would ink him and how he would draw him. So it's cool. That's it's awesome. super rad. And Rick Leonardi's a great dude. And he's actually very chill. He did some action shots and, you know, some breakdowns. And so then I love inking and comics and stuff. So then I would take that actually and apply that. This is sort of like what 2099 looked like using the ink texture applied to him and then what he ends up looking like in the film. And if you if you see him in the film, which you will, he's got this ink texture on top of him that sort of makes him look float, it moves with him. And the idea is like, you know, they're, they are they should be comic book characters that like come to life and mm -hmm. move around. It's sort of a way to like really ground him into like a comic book looking character. I'm the VFX supervisor. I basically make Sony Animation's dreams come true. <laughs> so, 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 what a true. statement. Yeah, right. <laughs> we work very closely with them, uh, the directors. This is a typical screening room where we would sit and do our reviews. So countless hours in here toiling away. Sony Animation, they handle the artwork, visual development, and basically all their aspirations. And what we try to do is take their paintings and bring them to life. I worked on the first film, I was in charge of the overall look of picture on the first one. In the first film, it was the first project where instead of using their artwork as an inspiration, we just wanted to bring it to life. And rolling into Mitchell's and then into this movie, this was like that on steroids. So everything we did in the first film, we brought to this in like a thousand times more. And what was I gonna, what I was gonna do today was focus on a little mini sequence just to kind of take you through a behind the scenes tour. I thought this would be a cool mini sequence to focus on I'm um, seeing a bunch in the trailer. I just loved how this came out. It's the world of 2099, world of Miguel O'Hara, and this sequence with Miles and Miguel just battling it out on the train it was just a really cool little section to focus on. Uh, these were some original visual development paintings that we got. Very graphic, very expressive, very early versions of his cape. And then this was the official turned over design that we got from Visual Development. So it's <coughs> basically everything that they're looking for. He's got a digital suit with very intricate markings and lights and static. Uh, so this is what we built our look dev out of. So we started painting and then this was the official model. So this was uh, him actually posed. Once we model him, we put a rig in him so he can move. And those blades are retractable, so they come and go. Uh, this was one of the first walking tests that we did. So we start to get him moving. How are things gonna react as he moves, the lights, the textures. We built a new line tool for him, which I'll go over in a minute, but everything in 2099 has this really cool line technique. And we love to make, bring stuff to life and make sure it works when things are moving. Because if things are locked down and they look static, it just doesn't sell the naturalism. And here's just a close up. And a close up of those lines. You can see as he moves, the lines come and go. It just brings a sense of sophistication to help sell it as it's not just like a flat painting. Uh, we also built this new inking technique that we actually, uh, we built on him and then we used on characters like Ben Riley also. Ben Riley's got way more pushed inking than Miguel, but uh, this was really cool because it allowed us to sort of trace the muscles. Mm -hmm. And we used real comic inspiration for this. This is stuff that I, I honestly wish we had done in the first movie. We just hadn't developed it enough, but you'll see this all over Miguel and other characters. Um, and then here is kind of where we ended up with him in look dev by zoom in, you can see the inking, the intricate texture work, all of these little lights move around at his suit. This actually doesn't have everything that you'll see in shot because he's got static and other types of breakup, but this is kind of where we got you before he got into shots. We also had to make Miguel without a mask on. So this was the turned over painting of him. One thing that scared us out of the gate was all of this brushwork on his face because he's got to talk, he's got to emote, he's got to perform. So what animation does is they create facial calisthenics and we use this to test our brush working techniques. So the brushes actually move and grow and repaint and move naturally. Because just like the line work, it has to move naturally for you to really believe it. Uh, and just some other quick sort of shot breakdown tests of Miguel that you'll see in the film. Uh, one of the techniques is solarization where anything in shadow just gets into flat color. 
And that's uh, one of the elements of the 2099 look. Here's another quick little breakdown of this shot. Just seeing different the environment, different atmosphere. Well, the world of 2099 is basically sort of like a retro vision of the future from like the 1970s. And it's really cool. We're inspired by Sid Mead and John Berkey. Uh, we have crowds in this film in 29 that have these wacky costumes on. Uh, but this was sort of the original reference that visual development used for a lot of their work. Um, we also have the 2099 comics, just for a lot of the styling. And then here are just some vehicle references for brushing and line work. Just loved this stuff. Couldn't wait to bring this to life. John Berkey paintings here. So when I do these films, especially uh, these really stylized ones, I always ask the directors, if you could give me an image that is like, could be a final frame of the film, what would that be? Because then we know what they're looking for. We know how to break it down. And this was an image of the 2099 world that they painted. It was really everything they wanted. Effects, depth of field, um, simplification, stylization. So this was a really awesome, and it, and it took a while to get there. We had to work with them to really get to this point where they had a painting of what they wanted the world to look like. And here just some other really cool ones where you can see how the world simplifies just to paper and line work in the background. So that was stuff we had to figure out. I'll just flip through this, but I just love the colors. And these were all done by Visual Development. All really early stuff. So we knew exactly what we had to develop. And we want to make the city feel like it's a living place with vehicles and buses and taxis. And then this next thing was our very first test shot with Miguel that we did. So this was using primitive buildings, very sort of low res environments. We hadn't built anything yet, except for this one car. Uh, but this is actually an early version of Miguel too. But this was so animation could get in there and do a performance, figuring out how he was gonna move, how his wingsuit was gonna act. And then you can see there are all these different brushes on the buildings and how they're gonna react. And you can see how we're simplifying buildings into brush strokes. Mm -hmm. Figuring out like a lens flare. What does that and look like in sick. this world? Um, you know, trying to get it illustrative. And you can see as he swings down here, how does spec move along those brushes? You can see the reflection in the buildings. And then here you can see how it simplifies just back into shapes like we saw in those paintings. How do we do that? So this was a really, really awesome test. Everyone was really excited about this and it helped propel things forward. And this is actually the same test but just the line work where you can see the different layers of lines. The blue lines are more loose. The ink lines are more tight to the forms. They're really, really cool. And I don't know if you remember our original teaser uh, but that's where we first saw a glimpse of this highway. So we started testing it out with cameras. You could see what the materials would do. Here's the actual shot from that teaser. Um, so this was really the first shot we ever did with Miguel on the movie was this teaser shot. Um, so we, we figured a lot out through this, like our burst cards, our graphic lens flares, and just how this world was gonna look. And then that basically brings us back to the shots. So this is where our cinematographers get the lens, they figure out what the lenses are gonna be, what the performance is gonna be, what the web, things basic like the webs and the action, and just really just getting the directors to buy into the, just the overall performance. Uh, things gradually out of layout, they go into animation. So I'll show you that same little mini cut out of Anna. And this is when things really start coming to life. Mm -hmm. You get expressions, you get motion lines. Animation does great stuff like simulating Miguel's mask coming off. They add line work to the face. They start to put in some temporary damage to the train. But it's really when it gets to animation that things come to life. You can see the battle damage on Miles' suit, the ink lines they're adding to his face. Really, really cool. They even add motion lines mm -hmm. to uh, around the highways so you can tell how fast we're going. So once things get out of Anna, we move into effects. Like our back end, two of them, two of the departments are effects in that painting. This is an effects render, but you can see they're starting to add the webs. So what you saw in Anum was more basic webs. Effects takes them and we replace them with coils and detail and the technology of the webs that we used in the first movie and some of which we use in our live action movies with Spider-Man too. Map painting gets in and they paint backgrounds like space stations. Effects adds motion lines. These are our lines and this is it with vapor added. In a scene like this where you're up in the middle of nowhere, how do you know how fast you're moving? You need motion cues like vapor and lines to really know how fast. And like this test here, you can tell we're going like super, super fast. You'd have no idea if you didn't have layers like this. Here's another matte painting layer of the earth below, the space station, very much in that 2099 style. And then here is that last shot, and here you can see Miles bashing into the train. You can see the um, 
surface moving around, effects adds additional lines to uh, their faces. And then that brings us to the final comp, which I'll play again. And this is where everything comes together. Uh, you can see there, in addition to everything I just showed you, we have streaking geometry. We've got burst cards, which I'll sit on one of those. So we did this on the first oh, one. Oh, that's so sick. Yeah, it's where, like, uh, what visual development does is they paint over top of the render. We do this throughout oh. the first movie, throughout this, but it's a really cool way to tie their work into ours. Uh, and then you'll also see just streaking geometry effects kind of takes the, the objects moving by and they add streaking to them. Now that you've kind of seen how we've gotten here, you can sort of pick out, oh, there's this damage, there are the ink lines, there are the webs. Sort of the breakdown comes together. But like I said, you know, it takes ages to get to this point. And when that first uh, official trailer came out with these shots, I was just so excited. I just loved this one. Uh, I was so excited for people to see this. And you can see Miguel's web. He's got like this cool like laser beam, hard edge sort of web going on. Welcome everyone. I'm a story artist on uh, Spider-Verse. I'm going to show you a little bit of the process of storyboarding generally, and then I'm going to work through a scene that is actually in the movie. It literally can start like this. This, you know, once you've talked to the directors and you get an understanding of what the scene is, this is often the first step for me, and we call it thumbnailing, and it really is. The drawings are about the size of your thumbnail, and all you're trying to do is capture something. Oh, you know, I know this is a scene between Miles and Spot. You know, they started the bodega and they're fighting and they ended up at the construction site. So what are the shots that I think best articulate that interaction? And you'll write little notes to yourself to sort of say, oh, it could be cool if we did this, it'd be cool if we did this. And it might be in the script, it might not be in the script. We use the script as a basis, but a lot of the directors, they encourage sort of like discovery. So if you find something that's working effectively while you're boarding it, then you pitch it as part of the sequence, and maybe it gets added to the movie. That has been replaced with this technology, which is the Cintiq, and it allows us to essentially draw directly into the computer. So, you know, once you've sort of like figured out, oh, I think I have a kind of a rough idea of what the scene is gonna be like, I'm gonna start drawing it, you would essentially just start doing stuff like this. So you're starting to block it out in a way that, oh, maybe Miles gets a bigger camera, whatever. You're, you're having a better understanding. And because it's digital, I can just crop these images out, save them as JPEGs, and then they can go directly to editorial. So edit can start working with the same stuff that we're working with. And it's just a way to sort of keep it all in the digital pipeline. So we pick up Miles and Spot are portaling into the construction site. So they come down, <laughs> big dust cloud, Jeff's kind of in the foreground. And we see that we are at Alchemax, which is where the first collider was. So already we're telling the audience this place is important. Cut to Jeff. He sees like, oh shit, I know where this is. Basically he starts running towards, into the site. A big truck starts, <laughs> just avoids Jeff. He gets out of the way, rumbles past. <laughs> and then way off in the background, we still see, you know, Miles and Spot. And they're arguing and fighting with each other. Come on, come on you have to take me seriously. You don't realize what's going on. <laughs> and then Miles and Spot smash into the, one of the pieces of construction, the people are running away. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> and they're way off in the distance, you can hear them still fighting and arguing as they go over the construction crane. And then back into like a concrete thing, they're still fighting. They destroy the side of the truck and all of the concrete spills out. And go, okay, man, what's going on? They're getting pissed off. Whip over. Jeff's now running up as Miles and Spot are basically like slap fighting each other in the foreground. And Jeff's like, you got me agreeing with the bad guy right now. Miles is like, he's barely a bad guy. Spot obviously getting kind of frustrated. You realize I'm right here. You're not even going to address me while we're fighting. And then he kind of pops out. Miles, this isn't about you. Spot still just kind of like doesn't really know what he's doing. Portals himself into the farther into the construction site. Oh, it isn't? Oh, I'm sorry. Am I not a good enough villain to get your full attention? Stumbles, Doosh. whoa. And then he falls, kind of looks up, and he sees where they are, the Alchemex site. Camera kind of like adjusts over to see the collider from the first movie. And this is important to Spot. He's like, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. 
Of course we'd end up here, back where it all started. Miles and his dad just kind of like, look, don't say anything. The creation event? They kind of look to each other, look back, still not really giving the respect. You need to lock in, Spider-Man. This is the place right here. You and me, this is where it happened. I was down there cracking the dimensional code, opening portals. Come on, man, it's the Collider. Obviously, Spock's getting really excited, wants Miles to respect him, looks down. You see what this means? And Miles is like, what I see is that you're trapped. You can't control your powers and you're a danger to yourself and others. No, no, you're, you're not listening. He's getting a little bit more pissed now. Miles hears the sirens of the cops showing up, so he just wants to get this kind of wrapped up. Looks back, more cops arrive. All right, we need to wrap this up. You're gonna get the full Spider-Man arrest package right now. <laughs> no! <laughs> Spot's getting frustrated, trying to build one of his portals to get at Miles. You make your little flippy, sassy jokes and everyone loves them. Building up his portal. <laughs> Miles still not really concerned because he doesn't know what he's doing behind him. Some bars just like kind of start shaking. And then shoom, they get pulled out. Miles looks over. Oh, ah! <laughs> doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, he's jabbed himself and he's kind of stumbling around. Hits a wall. I ah, just... Ah. But then, a brief moment, he grabs one of his portals and throws it at Miles. And Miles is like, whoa! And he actually has to avoid it by jumping up into the air. Miles does kind of a cool move, gets around, starts swipping, shoots some webs towards Spot. Spot's like, ha, you missed! But ultimately, what Miles was doing was knowing it would go through the portal, he would grab the big heavy equipment behind Spot, and then pull. Ah! Knock Spot down, he's trapped. Again, he doesn't have the ability to free himself yet. And now everyone is just starting to murmur and starting to laugh. And it's getting more and more frustrating. So Spot's trying to push himself up, but he can't. And then everyone's like, oh, this guy's a bozo. He doesn't even know how to get out of there. What a loser. What's happening? Hey! <laughs> and this is too much. This is kind of the point where Spot starts to get access to his powers. So he clenches his fists starts focusing his energy. Mm, the energy waves are going out. It's starting to pull the phones out of people's hands. It's starting to pull everything that's around them that's just starting to get distorted by his powers. And they start kind of like accumulating around him and all the dark matter starts building and building. But And Miles is now realizing, wait a minute, this might be a problem. And he's like, wait, is that dark matter? Yeah, I've been telling you that. And then Spock gets up slowly. Why won't you listen? And then all the dark matter sort of like comes to a point and gives him now the ability to push himself through and he frees himself and now he potentially controls his dark matter. You underestimate me at your peril, Spider-Man. Now Miles is like, uh-oh. And then, look at me. And all the stuff behind him starts distorting as he's warping the space around him. Miles is like, uh-oh, I tried to tell you, but you wouldn't listen. And there's a couple of flash, like, flash frames of the fact that they shared the space and he's distorting reality. Bigger and bigger pieces are starting to get pulled like metal cabinets are going. Miles is now genuinely a little bit concerned. Dark energy is starting to coalesce around him. All these pieces are like pulling together. His power is building. And then the collider starts turning on. And we see he's actually pulling cranes down and all this material is starting to collect. I was at the collider. And then slowly he just starts walking towards Miles. Miles pushes everyone back. The least you can do is give me the dignity of a real battle with Spider-Man. Keeps walking. Now this is real. And he's getting these weird spatial distortions that's going... Bruh, bruh. And Miles is now taking him very seriously. And Spot then just starts running. Do, 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 do. Uh, uh, and then we cut the. Uh, oh, Spot. Ah, what's gonna happen? You guys will have to see the movie and find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs>
So um, what we're going to do today is something called ADR, or Automated Dialogue Replacement. So this phase is usually, you know, after the movie is animated. So you already have the lip sync, right? We've already done either temp dialogue with not the real actors, or, um, you know, maybe the recording with the actor was a bad recording, or it didn't sound quite right, or the directors want a different inflection or something. So that's when we do ADR. So today you guys get a chance to do that. Yeah. We're gonna have, there'll be a little scene that we watch down. We have two characters, Gwen and Miles. We're gonna have Jordan, our engineer. Hi, Jordan. Hi, Jordan. Hello. Hello. He's gonna help guide us through, and you guys are gonna get to read. It's about four lines for each character, mm -hmm. and then at the end, he'll sync up your lines to the picture, and you guys will get to take that home and have your own oh little my God. scene. Oh, my yeah, pretty it. cool. <laughs> Miles, Miles, you got a minute? I've been good. I've been, yeah, just, uh, just great. Look at you. You, uh, you grew, huh? Had a little growth spurt? Brilliant. Good work. Cool, yeah, no. I used to play with these when I was younger, too. Perfect. Excellent, Gwen. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. How, how did you get, how did you get... Uh, how have you been? Uh, yeah, your hair has gotten pinker. It is, but my dorm room is is very adult. Good read. <laughs> Woo! It's so weird hearing yourself. Back <laughs> yeah, while you're while you're speaking. It's so weird talking. <laughs> Miles. Miles. You got a minute? Whoa, whoa, whoa! How how did you get? How did you get? How have you been? Uh, I've been good. I've been, yeah, just great. Look at you. You grew, huh? Had a little growth uh, spurt? Yeah, your hair has gotten pinker. Is this the room you grew up in? It is, but my dorm room is, is very adult. Cool, yeah, no. I used to play with these when I was younger, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, you feel like <laughs> Jovem Nerd, tapete vermelho assim. O que que tem? Oi? Essa jaqueta é de quê? Vira de costas aí. Que jogo é essa jaqueta aí? Borderlands, ué. A gente, eu tô urbano, <risos> tô numa mistura aqui. Tô urbano. É isso, gente. Ai, Qual meu problema? Deus do céu. You have no style or sense of fashion. O que que tem de errado? O cara não tá urbano? Doutor, você é ridículo. É isso aí. É ridículo. <risos> O maluco ali mandou o Sanduba. O Sanduba? Ali, ó. Mandou o um Sanduba. Mandou um... Isso é um burrito. <risos> Meu amigo, <risos> chamou no burrito. Onde é que tem esse burrito? Que eu, eu tô interessado. <risos> é cinco palmas de sanduíche. <risos> Só falta eles se apontarem uns aos outros, né? <risos> Caraca, todo mundo tinha que se apontar. <risos> <laughs> awesome guys, thank you. Hey, I should have got to do this for my faith, for favor, man. Oh, boy, you do it. Cara, sabe o que é engraçado? Uh. Tem muita, muita, muita influenciador aqui. Uh -huh. Celebridade, eu vi algumas, minor. Mas eu só sei que tem influenciador porque eu vejo a reação das pessoas. Ah, porque, porque eu não conheço nenhum. A gente não conhece os influenciadores daqui. Às vezes acontece com a Aí gente. Aí teve um cara que passou pessoa... aqui que eu conheço, que eu sigo no, no, no Instagram. Quem, quem é? Então, ele já sumiu e eu não sei o nome dele. Informação. O que ele faz? Ele faz vídeo, é isso. Faz vídeo. Eu não sei, cara. Esses influenciadores de hoje em dia, é, o conteúdo dos caras aparece em um segundo. É isso. Ah, tá, porque é tudo short, é isso? É. Tudo pequenininho? É. Esse cara que eu sigo especificamente, vamos ver se eu acho ele aqui. Ah, ele tá ali. Ele tá ali, ó. Tá ali em cima. Aqui, ó, esse cara. Ele dá dica pra hackear fast food. <risos> Caraca, que parada específica. Ele sabe menu escondido. Ah, é? É, os vídeos são muito bons. Ele, ele tem uma linguagem maneira. Uh -huh. Qual é o nome? Qual é o canal dele? Eu não sei, cara. <risos> ele simplesmente aparece na timeline, é isso? Eu não cara. Olha pra mim. I'm old and it sucks. Não, não é agora. Não é agora. Eu achava que era agora, não é agora. Pera aí, cara. Eu quero... Pera. Pera. Oh, 
Yeah. 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 Are you finished packing for school? Vamos entrar. Tem pipoca, hein? Tem, tem cheirinho de pipoca, uma pipoca. Cadê a pipoca? Tem esses cinemas clássicos de Los Angeles. O quê? Clássico o quê? Parece a estação de metrô? Ué, mas é, mas é a arquitetura de Los Angeles, cara. É, não, é. É dos antigos, é. Com certeza. Pega aqui o energético do meu aranha pra mim. Olha aí. Peraí, deixa eu pegar o mais gelado aqui. Nossa. Aí, cara, do Miguelito. Olha aí. O cara, em vez de vir com a camisa, uma jaqueta do Homem-Aranha, o cara me vem com a jaqueta de sei lá o que, que é isso, Porque eu não tenho do jaqueta do Homem-Aranha. Puta merda. Vou ter que achar uma maneira. Olha, isso aqui é das antigas, maluco. É, isso aqui é muito roots, cara. <risos> Olha, Zagal. Olha! Caraca aí. Cinema de dois andares. Ah, é outra antiga brincadeira. Mesmo, né? Olha que bonito. Que cinema é maneiro, cara. <risos> Lindo, né? Lembra do Rox Copacabana? Ô, oh, Rox, ô oh, Copacabana! Oh, cinema Pô, esse cinema aqui tem história. Com certeza, muito bom. Cara, olha. As pipoquinha tudo já na cadeira. Olha que beleza. Vai ser maneiro, vai ser uma Pô, experiência olha. ver aqui. Caraca, cara. mas quantas pessoas cabem aqui? É muita gente. É muita gente. É muita gente. Balkan Wright BB28. A gente tá no cantinho? É olha. isso? O quê? O 28. <risos> Botando botar na gente no, canti, no Porra, cantinho. Tu tá, tu tá na primeira mundial da parada. E tu quer sentar no quê? A primeira fila? Porra, que Porra, tá cara, ótimo. Que vacilo, tá no cantinho. Cara, no o can... cara, eles estão literalmente pagando pra você assistir o um filme. Não, eu tô... E tu tá reclamando que tá no cantinho? Não é possível isso. <risos> Porra, pelo amor de é, Deus! Todo mundo que vê um filme não quer ver no canal. Você vê que a gente tá tão longe. Porra, dá pra ver tudo! Dá pra ver bonito, né? Caraca! É. É, Arquibancada, não. mezanino, maravilhoso! É, é, é não maravilhoso. Não me faz passar vergonha não, aqui, não. Não, tô, não, não, eu tô Porra, agradecido. Só ali, tamo junto! Já, porque... Tamo junto! Melhor porque... cantinho do mundo! <risos> Pô, tá brincando! <risos> é literalmente o último! É o último, o último meu é ali. O último é ali. <risos> é o último aqui, né? É verdade, o último é isso aqui. Mas, cara, ai, tá bom, 28. Caraca, tá reclamando? Não, tô... Tem gente que trabalhou nessa produção não, não, não. e sabe onde a pessoa tá agora? Em casa. Você é um cara não engraçado do Brasil. Não tô reclamando. Engraçado que faz uns vídeos pro YouTube e tá aqui. Cara, isso, eu é, não ver... tô isso é uma falta de vergonha na cara. Falando que o meu é muito... inacreditável. Esse aqui, não. Eu, se fosse achando, eu não chamava mais. Não, para com isso. Eu para só me chamo não, aqui, não eu só aqui. Eu tô extremamente Tamo agradecido junto. de poder ver em primeira mão <risos> estreia mundial. <risos> tá eu não, tô, não estou reclamando. Caraca, eu tô, eu tô só vendo você que... pa... quantas vezes você pagou na sua vida pra ver o um filme sentado no chão? <risos> é verdade. Sentado no chão. de mazanina eu vi sentado no chão. E agora você tá vendo. Ah, que tá cara bom. de pau. Inacreditável. <risos> que filha da. Jovem Nerd, né, a gente esqueceu de falar uma parada. A gente tá no filme. Caraca, é verdade! Não nessa versão do filme. Não, que é em inglês. A gente, a gente... A gente teve uma participação especial a convite da Sony. Com Fizemos Sony. uma frasezinha cada. Uma frasezinha. One liners, uh -huh. one liners. Sim. Nesse multiverso de Homem-Aranha. Porra, cara. A gente é... isso, Vou mano. atualizar meu LinkedIn. Ah, exatamente. A gente tem que descobrir qual é que o Homem-Aranha... O Asa... As Aranha. As Aranha. O Jovem Aranha, sei lá. Aranha, Aranha Nerd. Aranha Nerd e o As Aranha... Eu não sei. Agora que você for ver o filme, procura por a gente. Vai. Quais são os nossos aranhas? Exato. Quais são os nossos aranhas? <risos> Muito Quais bom. são? Ai, ai. Eu mesmo não sei. <risos> Perguntinha da semana, Zagal. Quando tiver um aranha brasileiro, como é que ele vai ser? <risos> Excelente.